right now from KTAB News, your local election headquarters. This is Big Country Politics. Well, thanks for being here. I'm Victor Sotelo. This is a special edition of Big Country Politics. We're taking an in-depth look at the U.S. race uh, for Senate here in Texas. We're sitting down with both candidates for exclusive interviews. Here is News Director Travis Rees talking with Senator John Cornyn first. All right, welcome back to Big Country Politics. And joining me now is Senator John Cornyn. Senator Cornyn, thank you so much for joining us here today. Good to be with you. All right, so there are a lot of things working in Washington. Tell me about the COVID-19 relief bill. Well, as you know, we've, uh, we've, we've passed about four bills totaling $2.9 trillion. Uh, this is an unprecedented experience in our lifetime. Maybe the closest thing to it happened back in 1917, 1918 with the Spanish flu pandemic. But this has changed everything for, from public health to our economy. And as we've tried to work together to try to stop the spread, um, as we are looking into discoveries for vaccines and treatments, um, Congress has tried to act essentially on a war footing uh, to try to both fight the virus and also the economic consequences. So uh, we, we passed the, uh, the last bill back in the late March. I think it's been helpful for us to, to watch and see how that money is being used and where, what's working and what's not. And so now we have a chance to pass another one to deal with uh, the longer than we expected economic fallout as we continue to support our frontline healthcare heroes who are providing treatments to our uh, to people who've become infected with the virus and uh, need that uh, extra care. All right, very good. So as you know, several businesses, local businesses in particular, are suffering. What's your message to them and, and how is this bill, help, is it helping them? Well, the, I believe the most successful part of our, um, our legislation so far is the Paycheck Protection Program. These are low interest loans that can be converted into grants if um, people maintain their employees on their payroll. This is really the third line of defense to help people whose jobs are being lost or displaced as a result of the virus. First, we sent direct payments uh, to individuals making up to $75,000 a year. Then we enhanced unemployment insurance benefits, but then again, to ensure that both the businesses can stay afloat and their employees on the payroll, we, we passed the payroll protection program. So far, uh, 370,000 loans have been made and uh, to and the 40, 40, $40.5 billion in loans just in Texas alone. So this has been perhaps the single most successful uh, part, of the pro, uh, part of our response, but from an economic standpoint, but obviously we're, we're still in the middle of this and we're trying to, we're trying to adjust it and adapt. Abilene Mayor Anthony Williams um, just tested positive for COVID-19. So it's uh, fresh even more so on the minds of Abilinians and folks all across the big country. Um, do you have a message for folks, uh, perhaps precautionary? Well, I, please, uh, please pass my, my uh, sympathies on to the mayor. I hope he's one of the many who will not uh, experience much in the way of symptoms. That actually, ironically, has been one of the biggest challenges because a lot of people get the virus, they test positive, but they don't actually feel sick or they don't feel, they, they don't need hospitalization for sure. And, but they can spread it to others. And we know that this uh, virus is particularly deadly in people 80 years and older and people with underlying chronic disease. So that's important for people to know whether they're positive or not. So they can isolate themselves and they can, we can protect others. But at the meantime, we know the virus is not going away anytime soon, and we need to learn how to follow the guidelines like washing hands, maintaining social distancing, wearing masks when you can't, and then stay home if you're sick. These are some of the standard operating procedures that can allow us to, to go on about our daily business, maybe with some modifications, but to do so uh, safely. All right, so it looks like you, you're working once again to pass a June 19th holiday bill. Can you talk about that? 
Well, after the death of George Floyd at the hands of many a Minneapolis policeman, that appears to be without any justification at all, uh, we've it's revived conversations we've had about racial um, injustice in our country. And as you know, our country founded on the proposition that all men and women are created equal. Um, unfortunately, we didn't treat African Americans that way. We went through a terrible civil war and a civil rights. A renaissance in America, and only to realize that there are communities, particularly African American and communities of color, where they feel like they are not being treated fairly or the same way that other people are being treated. And so, uh, this is, uh, I think it's a time for national uh, reconciliation on race. And to do that, we need to remember our history. And uh, Juneteenth, as you know, commemorates the day two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by Abraham Lincoln when uh, northern troops showed up in Galveston, Texas and told the slaves they were free. This is two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. So I propose to make this a national holiday, again, because, you know, if you don't remember your history or you don't know your history, you don't learn anything from it. And so I think this is, a, is, a, is an appropriate thing to do to demonstrate our understanding of our sometimes checkered past, but how we can learn from it and learn to live together and treat each other as equals. And the El Paso shooting is, uh, we're about to celebrate the one year anniversary. Can you talk to me about what is being done on the political scale um, and, and what we still need to do um, uh, in regards to uh, shootings like that? Well, obviously that was a great tragedy like the one in Odessa and like the one in, uh, in uh, Sutherland Springs outside of San Antonio. What I've done is I've tried to improve the background check system so that we eliminate the possibility that those who are, have criminal records have uh, been convicted of domestic violence who've been institutionalized because of mental illness, that those people cannot get access to firearms. Unfortunately, we've seen big gaps in the background check system that's let some of those same people get firearms. I believe strongly in in the rights of law-abiding citizens to keep and bear arms, but I think most Texans certainly would agree with me that it it comes to getting guns out of the hands of convicted felons and people who are mentally unstable that this is something we should do. So that's where I've concentrated most of my efforts. We passed the first uh, background check improvement law in uh, I think about 25 years called Fix Nix. That's the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, which in the case of one shooting completely failed because the Air Force in that instance did not upload conviction records, which would have prevented the sale uh, the, law, the otherwise lawful sale of a gun to somebody with a d- record of a felony uh, domestic violence. Back to Abilene here, as you know, Dias Air Force Base, a huge um, part of our community and a huge part of our economy. We love our airmen here in Abilene. Um, y- you know, the B-21 is on the horizon. So um, talk to me just a little bit about, you know, the, 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 the change from the B-1 to the B-21 and, and where that is. Well, the, let me just say the Abilene community is a credible supporter of Dias Air Force Base. My dad was in the Air Force for 31 years, so I'm an Air Force brat. And uh, I know the importance of uh, Dias to the community, but also the, of the community to Dias and supporting our young men and women, uh, our airmen. And, uh, and you're right, we are getting in the, ready to uh, bring online the long-range bomber, the B-21, and I've been talking to the uh, folks there at uh, Dias and in the community about how do we make sure they're, they're based uh, there at Dias because uh, that's an important uh, way to accomplish the mission of keeping America safe, but also of keeping Dias uh, relevant and not uh, being put through the base closing process. So some of these airframes have been around a long time. Uh, our pilots are still flying the B-52 which has been around for half a century. Um, uh, and, uh, but some of these airframes ultimately will need to be uh, retired. And that's why the, 
and also the threats continue to get to be more serious, and that's why it's important to maintain our technical and uh, uh, edge when it comes to our uh, aircraft, like the long-range bomber. So uh, I've been talking to the Air Force, as I have the local community there, about making sure that um, Dias gets its fair share of the B-21s, and uh, I think uh, they couldn't. there's no better place for them to be. And finally, um, about three months until that November Day election, how are you feeling? Well, this is a very unusual uh, period of time. I've, you know, I, I'm, Texas has historically been a red state, but uh, Senator Cruz's race in 2018 demonstrated that you can't take that for granted by any means. And all of these races, particularly for the Senate, are national races because they affect the balance of power, who's in the majority and who's in the minority. And uh, certainly uh, we've got our work to do. Uh, right now, there is a lot of uncertainty associated with the pandemic, COVID-19. You know, we're on the cusp of kids going back to school or perhaps continuing their inline, or I should say online learning um, and transitioning whenever parents and teachers feel safe. So there's a lot of uncertainty right now. and. Uh, I believe that uh, this is going to be a very tough election. Uh, I'm glad to see President Trump was in Midland yesterday, and he's not taking Texas for granted. Uh, but if Texas because, becomes a Democratic uh, state, uh, a blue state, then uh, Republicans will never see another Republican president in our lifetime. So we're taking this very, very seriously and working hard to earn each and every vote. Senator Cornyn, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Travis. Good to see you. All right, and still here to come on Big Country Politics, here from Senator Cornyn's Democratic challenger, M.H. Hager. We're back in two minutes.